This evening, I want to invite you to turn in your syllabus to the section that is titled Biblical Evidence for Male Headship. That is page 17 in your syllabus, page 17. Now we have a lot of material to cover, and I know that this is a difficult time. We've been here all day, and uh, we had a delicious meal <laughs> just uh, three hours ago. But uh, try and bear with me. Uh, the syllabus, I'm sure, will be helpful, uh, bec unless you go to sleep reading the syllabus. <laughs> but I'm hoping that um, it will prove a blessing to have this in written form so you'll be able to follow along a little bit better. Before we begin, though, I would like to have another word of prayer to ask God to be with us in our study together. And so let's just bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for these precious hours of the Sabbath that begin. We thank you that as the world is about their business, we are about your business. We thank you because we can take one whole day, 24 whole hours, and just unwind and remember where we came from, why we are here, and what our destiny will be. We ask, Father, that as we open your holy book once again this evening, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us, help us to understand, but even more importantly, having understood, I ask that you will help us to be willing to receive what you have for us. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we'll begin at the very top of the page. By the way, uh, tomorrow evening, I will be dealing a little bit more extensively with the issue of male headship. Probably many of you are aware that the Theological Seminary at Andrews University came out with a statement uh, against the idea of male headship, uh, not in the home necessarily, but in the church, um, saying that Jesus Christ is the only head of the church. And that's true. Jesus Christ is the only head of the church. And Jesus Christ is the only shepherd of the church, too. But Jesus Christ has under-shepherds. And even though Jesus is the head, he has individuals who serve as, so to speak, heads under his absolute leadership. But we'll deal with that a little bit more uh, in our study tomorrow evening. Now let's go from the very top of uh, this page, and we'll go through this material. We have quite a bit of material to, to uh, cover. I'm going to do my best to cover all of the material uh, because um, tomorrow during the worship service we want to study 1 Corinthians 11 and then tomorrow evening I want to deal with uh, this other issue uh, that I was just mentioning a moment ago. Male headship or leadership in the home and in the church is not to be understood as the man being the head honcho, the dictator, or the boss. It is to be understood as one who is the loving leader, protector, provider, counselor, guide, and loving companion of the wife as well as of the church members. Now we're going to take a look at several biblical evidences of male headship both in the home and in the church, which is a large item of debate these days within the Seventh-day Adventist church, primarily in North America, in Western Europe, as well in, as in South Asia, uh, places like Australia and New Zealand and uh, even uh, Korea. Now, let's go through these reasons one by one and see what the Bible has to say about this issue. Reason number one, man was created first. That is, the male was created first. Now, uh, somebody might say, well, what difference does that make? Well, the fact is that the Apostle Paul, harking back to the creation account, explain that the woman is not allowed or permitted to teach or to have authority over the man 
because the man was created first and then the woman. Let's read Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 to see who was created first. See, Paul is depending on the book of Genesis. It says, And the Lord God formed the man. It has the definite article in the Hebrew, Ha-Adam. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And then we notice in the succeeding verses that God creates or makes the woman after he made the man. The Genesis account is absolutely crystal clear. And so the Apostle Paul, referring to the creation account before sin, had this to say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I do not permit a woman... The word there is gune in Greek, very gender specific. To teach or to have authority, notice that this teaching and authority go together. To teach or to have authority over a man, and the Greek word is aner, which is a very gender specific word. There's a word for man that is generic, which is anthropos, where we get the word anthropology from. But when the Bible uses gune and aner, it's very gender specific. For example, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 says, Husbands, love your wives. The very same words that we find uh, here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 12 and 13. Now notice what he continues saying, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. And now notice the rationale, but to be in silence, for, what does that mean, for? He's going to give the reason now. For or because Adam was formed first and then Eve. Was the Apostle Paul as inspired as Moses? So should we take what the Apostle Paul says seriously? Of course we should. Now in Genesis you don't find directly, overtly, that... Uh, the woman is not allowed to exercise authority of the man because the man was created first and then woman. But Paul gives his inspired commentary about the significance of that in the book of Genesis. It will be noticed that Paul's rationale for submission of the woman to the man in an ecclesiastical worship setting, which is, the, if you read the context, this has to do with church, is based on the creation order and not on culture or on the fall. Because at this time there really was no culture. <laughs> was there? No, the culture was going to develop after this. They'd just been created. The teacher's commentary captures well the role that God has reserved for men. Now notice this is not a Seventh-day Adventist commentary. It says there, 1 Timothy 2, 11-15, does not teach that women cannot exercise their spiritual gifts when the body meets. We know that women can and are to exercise their spiritual gifts. Now, what does it mean then? Instead, the passage has a more narrow focus on the role of a ruling elder. To teach, as defined with authority, is an elder's function. And by the way, in the very next chapter, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, it speaks about a bishop. So uh, in context, this is talking about the elder or the bishop of the church, two words that are used interchangeably. It continues saying, uh, this particular function in the body of Christ, and only this function is reserved for men. Now it's very important for us to realize, and this is not in your notes, that 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy as well were written not for a specific church, but they were written for the church at large, how the church should behave and conduct itself in a worship setting. Notice 1 Timothy 3 verses 15 and 16 where this comes out very clearly. Actually, let's start at verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 uh, and 15. 
Here, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, his pupil, and he says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, the Apostle Paul says, If I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to what? To conduct yourself where? To conduct yourself where? In the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So uh, does this apply to the way people are supposed to conduct themselves in the church? Absolutely. Now somebody might be wondering, and this isn't in your notes either, what did Paul mean when he stated that the woman must be silent in the worship service? Did he mean that women couldn't speak at all in congregational worship? No. You see, the particular word that is translated silence in this verse is used four times in the New Testament. If you look at those four references, uh, I'll give them to you, Acts 22, verse 2, 2 Thessalonians 3, 12, and 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. It's used in verse 11, and then it's used again in verse 12. The word means to be peaceful, to be tranquil, to be in quietness, and to be in stillness. And we have to link the word authority with the idea of silence and with the idea of teaching. In other words, women can speak in church, but they cannot teach with what Ellen White calls full ecclesiastical authority. That is reserved to the elders of the church, and Scripture makes it very clear that the elders of the church must be the husbands of one wife. The Bible is explicit on that point. Now, what did uh, our pioneers believe about this? In your syllabus, you'll notice that there's a quotation from Signs of the Times uh, written by the editor, J. H. Wagner, Wagner, on December 19, 1878. Here is what he said. The divine arrangement, even from the beginning, when, when did God establish this arrangement? In the beginning is this, that the man is the head of the woman. Every relation is disregarded or abused in this lawless age. What would he say today? <laughs> now notice what the standard is. But the scriptures always maintain this order in the family relation. And then he quotes Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And then he makes this comment. Man is entitled to certain privileges that are not given to woman, and he is subjected to some duties and burdens from which the woman is exempt. A woman may pray, prophesy, exhort, and comfort the church. All you have to do is read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says that women can prophesy, they can pray in public. But now notice how he ends. But she cannot occupy the position of a pastor or ruling elder. This would be looked upon as usurping authority over the man which is here prohibited. Is that clear? Now there's another remark or another comment that was made in January of 1895, also in Signs of the Times. A question was asked of the editor, and this is the question. Should women be elected to offices in the church when there are enough brethren? Now here comes the answer, the editor's response. If by this is meant the office of elder, we should say at once, no. But there are offices in the church which women can fill acceptably. And oftentimes there are found sisters in the church who are better qualified for this than brethren. Such offices, for instance, as church clerk, treasurer, librarian of the Tract Society, that means uh, the director of uh, outreach, we would call today, etc., as well as the office of deaconess, assisting the deacons in looking after the poor and doing 
uh, and in doing such other duties as would naturally fall to their lot. You know, when I read this statement at the uh, Pacific Union constituency session, a special constituency session, you immediately, when I read that the, that the woman could serve as a church clerk, the treasurer, the librarian, uh, assisting the, deacon, the deacons of the church, there was instantly a murmur of protest, <laughs> as if to say, uh, you mean to say those are the only roles that we can have in the church? We can't have the top position in the church? As if it was really the top position. You know, the top position is really determined by who is willing to serve. Amen. Isn't that right? According to Jesus. Now, the editor continues saying, the qualifications for church elder are set forth in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 and Titus 1, 7 through 9. We do not believe, notice it says, we do not believe. So it's not only him individually. We do not believe that it is in God's plan to give to women the ordained offices of the church. By this we do not mean to depreciate their labors, service, or devotion. Now listen carefully to this. Because these days, those who are opposed to women's ordination, immediately the accusation is, you don't believe that women are equal. If you don't believe that women should be ordained and should be elders of the church, immediately they say, you believe that women are inferior to men. You don't believe that women and men are equal. That's false. Because the God, the Father, and the Son are equal. But the Son is subject to the authority of the Father. Notice what he continues saying. By this we do not mean to depreciate their labors, service, or devotion. The sphere of woman is what? equal, and it's in italics, by the way, in, in the original, is equal to that of man. She was made a helpmeet or fit for man. But that does not mean that in her sphere or her role is what? Identical to that of man's. The interests of the church and the world generally would be better served if the distinctions Given where? Given in God's word were regarded. What is the source of authority for his remarks? The word of God. And he actually quotes from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. That is a simple reading of the Bible text. Now some people argue, they say, well, it does say husband of one wife, but you know, that's a, that really means faithful to your spouse. And so they remove the gender specificity of the text. That's not what the text says. The text says the husband of one wife. It is very general, uh, it is very general, uh, gender specific. So that's the first reason that is given in Scripture and amplified by the Apostle Paul. Man was created first and then woman. The second reason for male headship that we find in Scripture is that the woman was taken from man. And once again, we find the source is in Genesis before sin. Genesis 2, verses 21 and 22. Genesis 2, 21 and 22 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he, that is God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So does the Bible make it very clear that the woman was taken from the man? Absolutely. You say, what difference does that make when it comes to the issue of who occupies the position of headship? Well, if you just read the Genesis account, you might not conclude that it is extremely significant, but once again the Apostle Paul tells us under inspiration that this is a significant point. And the Apostle Paul was just as inspired as was Moses. Do you believe that? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul clearly says, that, and we'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit more, that the woman should wear a veil as a sign of submission to male authority in a church context. And he gives the reason in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8, he says, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. 
That is the inspired commentary of the order of creation in Genesis and who was taken from whom. And we have to take the Apostle Paul seriously. You'll notice that Paul's argument has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with God's plan after sin. Because this is happening before sin. This is part of God's creation order. Now in the Bible, origin and authority are very closely related. For example, Jesus is preeminent and above all creation. Why is Jesus preeminent and above all creation? Because He what? He preexisted it and He brought it into existence. It comes from Him, in other words. Jesus is described as the head of the body because He brought the church into existence and sustains it. That's why He exercises authority over the church. Now by way of analogy, children are required to render respect and obedience to their parents, to the authority of their parents, right? Why? Because they derive their existence from their parents. Adam was the source of Eve, and as such she owed him submissive and loving respect as her head. Now, it's been argued by egalitarians, that means people who believe that uh, men and women have interchangeable, equal interchangeable roles in the home and in the church. Egalitarians say that if priority of existence gives someone authority, then the animals would have authority over man because they were created first. <laughs> and you know, you snicker at annual council, that argument was used by those who favor women's ordination and um, you know I we had a representative from Secrets Unsealed that was there and uh, immediately everybody started laughing you know because because it's a silly argument for two reasons number one the creation account explicitly states that man was to have a dominion over the animals and secondly Paul under inspiration was the one who said that it is significant that the woman was taken from man, and it has to do with the authority structure, doesn't he? And so, you know, and besides, the animals are in a different category than human beings. It's just an argument that makes absolutely no sense. Reason number three, Eve was created to be man's helper. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 2. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So for whom was Eve made? She was made for Adam, not Adam for Eve. You say, well, what's so important about that? How do you get the idea that the man is to be the head and the woman is to be submissive to uh, the authority of the man by just simply saying that the woman was created to be the helper of man? Well, if you read the creation account by itself, it might not appear to be significant. But once again, the Apostle Paul, who is equally inspired as Moses, says this is significant. This is important in determining the uh, authority structure and the relationship between male and female. And in fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 9, which we'll study in more detail tomorrow, in an ecclesiastical setting, the Apostle Paul says that the woman is to wear a sign of authority on her head, the authority of the man, because neither was man created from wo for woman, but woman was created for man. Are you following me or not? Now, does this uh, statement by Paul have anything to do with culture? Does it have anything to do with God's plan changing after the fall? No, because this is taking place before the fall. Now, in spite of the fact that Paul makes this clear affirmation, 
women's ordination advocates have gone to great lengths to attempt to prove that the word helper does not contain the idea of submission. In fact, they point out that this word helper or helpmeet is used most frequently in the Old Testament to refer to God helping man, that is a superior helping an inferior. And that's true. The word is used most of the times in the Old Testament to refer to God helping man, a superior helping an inferior. And so what is their conclusion? Their conclusion is the woman is superior to the man. This has several problems. First, the word helper, as it is used for God, clearly applies to one who is greater than man. Is that true? Of course. God is eternal and infinite, and we are time-bound and finite. It bears noting that most of the times that the word helper is used in the Old Testament, God is helping man in the context where man is in serious trouble and needs God's intervention to help him escape his predicament. If a person is sinking, sinking in quicksand and cries out, Help! Would not the helper be greater than the one who is helped? The relationship of God to man is clearly that of a greater to a lesser by God's very nature. But the same is not true of the relationship between the man and the woman. Second, the logic of the egalitarians, those who believe in equal roles, interchangeable roles, is seriously flawed because it contradicts the clear words of the Apostle Paul. Doesn't it? Yes or no? I know it's been a long day. Give me some feedback. Does Paul clearly make a point of this? Yeah. So, uh, so they say it doesn't make any difference. What are they saying about Paul? They're saying that we can't take what Paul says and use it to interpret the book of Genesis. By the way, this is typical historical critical methodology. They say, you know, the Adventists believe that, you, that the proper way of interpreting the Bible is you allow one text to explain another text and another text to explain this text. Sola Scriptura, the analogy of Scripture, you allow the Bible to interpret itself by comparing all that the Bible has to say on that, on that point. The historical critical method says, no, 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 you can't use what Paul wrote to explain Genesis. You have to explain Genesis within itself. They isolate texts and they do not allow other texts from Scripture to explain other texts. In Paul's estimation, it is true that woman and man were created by God as equals, and yet he makes it crystal clear that functionally the woman was made to help the man and not vice versa. Now, let me share with you what uh, the straw men that are built sometimes by those uh, who mischaracterize those of us who are opposed to women's ordination. An assistant to the president of a large conference on the West Coast, I don't like to identify people by name, who favors women's ordination asked the question, and this I quote now, did God create woman with the intent that she be a lesser order of humanity? The context, now listen to the context, of the administrator's question is important. He's dealing with the fact that the woman was created to be man's helper. He states, in our English language, the word helper carries with it the suggestion of lesser to greater, he says in English. But I'm going to show you that's not true. But the Hebrew does not carry such meaning. The assistant as is frequent with egalitarians, has built a straw man as tall as Nebuchadnezzar's image. You know, they say, this is what those who are uh, opposed to women's ordination believe, but they don't really believe it. So then they knock down the argument and, and they make the people who are against women's ordination look bad. Complementarians, that is those who believe in male headship and female submission in the right sense of these words, 
do not believe that the word helper in Genesis means that the woman was made to be a lesser order of humanity. Those are the words that were used by, the, by this individual from a conference in the West Coast. This is a mere caricature of the view that we hold. What complementarians do believe is that women, that woman was created equal to man as a being, but with a different function. She was made to complement man, not man to complement her. The Genesis account and the Apostle Paul are both crystal clear on this point. Further, is it true that in our English language the word helper carries with it the suggestion of lesser to greater? Not always, he said in English. So let's see what, English, uh, what the English language says. Two beings can be equal in status, dignity, and value as persons, and yet one can be of the other's helper. On a human level, the word helper can be understood in two different ways. A mother can tell her daughter to help her set the table. Although the mother and the daughter are equal as beings, the helper is subject to the mother's authority. Would you agree? This would be a case of a lesser helping a greater. On the other hand, a parent may help a child with his homework. Even though the parent is the helper of the child, the child is under the parent's authority, correct? This would be the case of a greater helping a lesser. And by the way, in at least one case in scripture, the word helper is used to describe a lesser helping a greater. So it's not true that in every case in Scripture, you know, the word helper is a greater helping a lesser. There, are, there is one case where a lesser is helping a greater. Now on a divine level, the same is true. Even before sin came into the universe, Jesus was the Father's helper. Was He? We read a statement last night. He executed the Father's will at creation. He was next in authority to the Father. Ellen White says that he was next in authority to the Father. So who is the utmost authority? The Father. The Father installed him, Ellen White explains, as the commander of the angelic hosts. The Father installed him as Michael. Does this mean that the Son was inferior to the Father in eternity past? Does this mean that Jesus was a lesser order of deity? The simple fact is that though the Father and the Son are equal as persons, the Son is the Father's helper. In the plan of salvation, the Father did not come to the earth to battle the tempter, to suffer and die. Jesus helped the Father accomplish the work of redemption by doing His Father's will. Did this make Jesus a lesser being than the Father? Does, this fa does the fact that Jesus helps His Father make Him a lesser divinity? Of course not. According to Jesus, the greatest in the kingdom is the one who condescends to serve and to help. And by the way, this is one of the things that shows me that this move for women's ordination is on the wrong track because of the attitude of those who are pushing for women's ordination. It, we are going to get it passed no matter what, and we're going to use every method under the sun to get it accomplished. And it's a desire to ascend to a higher position. I'm not happy, you know, I'm not happy being a deaconess. I want to be an elder. Seems to me like in heaven there was once one who had an attitude like that. <clears throat> and yet, would the condescension of the son make him greater than the father? No, because Jesus said what? The father is greater than I. To use another example, in the early church, the seven deacons were elected to help the apostles with the administrative matters of the growing church. Were the deacons inferior to the apostles as persons? No. No doubt the deacons followed the leadership of the apostles, and yet as human beings in the sight of God, they were equal. They were subordinate in function because they were ordained to help the apostles, but 
they were not a lesser order of humanity, to use the administrative assistance words. In short, the deacons were the apostles' helpers, but they were not inferior to them. Are you understanding this point? They built so many straw men, I mean, it's almost like a bunch of scarecrows in a field. They attribute to us who are opposed to women's ordination all sorts of arguments that we never believe. And it's to make those who are against women's ordination look bad in the minds of people who don't study. Reason number four, Adam was created taller than Eve. I mentioned that last night and a tall woman came, looked me right straight in the <laughs> eye. <laughs> she is right there. <laughs> and she says, I'm just as tall as the men, something along that line. <laughs> and, and taller than most men. And who was I to argue at that point? <laughs> My life, I felt, was in danger. <laughs> just kidding. When I said that this is the height is significant, I'm talking about God in a perfect world. Sin has made some... Isn't it generally true that uh, women are shorter than men, yes. even today? Yes, it's generally true. There are some exceptions. But if sin had not entered the universe, male and female would have multiplied in the size that God made them in God's original plan. Let me read you that statement from Ellen White. It's in your syllabus. Signs of the Times, January 9, 1879. Ellen White says, Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. Her head reached a little above his shoulders. And you say, so what? Why did God create Adam taller than Eve? Would not egalitarianism require them to be the exact same size? Some might think that this original height difference was inconsequential or had aesthetic purposes. But upon closer inspection, we shall see that in God's original order, height difference is related to authority. Let me give you some examples from the spirit of prophecy. Are all the angels equal? Yeah, they are, as beings. But are there some angels that are higher in authority than other angels? That's a bad thing, right? See, the bad thing is with the way we think. The problem is in our brain. The problem is not, see, what people today don't like authority. There are words that were strongly disliked by those who favor women's ordination. The word authority made them bristle. The word submission. The, the, the reference to man is the head. Ooh. Talk about opening a can of worms. Ellen White explains elsewhere in her writings that tall angels stand at the head at the what? At the head of companies and have commanding authority over the shorter ones. Note the following examples. When Lucifer prepared for war against Christ, we are told that the angels were marshaled in companies, each division with a higher commanding angel at their head. I thought Jesus was the only head. Well, if Jesus is the only head, why does it say that, the, that there's this angel at the head? It must be that there are heads under the head. Are you with me? I'll have much more evidence uh, on this uh, in our uh, discussion tomorrow afternoon. When Jesus was arrested by the mob in Gethsemane, we are told that many companies of holy angels, each with a tall commanding angel, at their what? head were sent to witness the scene. As God's people are crying out for deliverance in the final time of Jacob's trouble, we are told that the angels wished to intervene to deliver them. But a tall, commanding angel suffered them not. He said, the will of God is not yet fulfilled. They must drink the cup. They must be baptized with the baptism. Are the lower angels subject to the authority of the commanding angels. 
Ooh, that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. God is a God of order. Now, regarding the physical height of Jesus, before He came to this world, we are told, before Christ left heaven and came into the world to die, He was taller than any of the angels. He was majestic and lovely. What about when Jesus became incarnate? Ellen White says in 7 Bible Commentary, page uh, uh, 904, before Christ left heaven, and oh, this is, this is the one I just read. It says there, He was but little what? Little taller than the common size of men then living upon the earth. When Jesus ascended to heaven, by the way, He recovered His original height. In fact, Ellen White has an interesting statement in Spiritual Gifts where she says that as Jesus was ascending to heaven, the Father performed a miracle and He made Jesus grow to the height that He had had originally in heaven. I'll give it to you afterwards. I don't have the reference right now, but I, I can find it for you. Ellen White describes the physical size of Jesus when the saints will enter the holy city. She says in early writings, page 288, He stood head and shoulders above the saints and above the angels. Does height have anything to do with authority? It most certainly does. Well, she doesn't say that, but probably. Number five. Despite egalitarian claims to the contrary, the creation story indicates that before the entrance of sin into the world, Adam gave Eve the name woman. Genesis 2 verse 23 says as much. Adam said, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Is naming an exercise of authority? Yes, it is. Nebuchadnezzar named Daniel and his three friends. He was exercising his authority. In Philippians chapter 2 it says that when Jesus ascended to heaven, the Father gave him a name that is above every name. And Adam exercised his authority also by naming the animals. So the fact that Adam named Eve, woman, indicates that he had authority over the woman. Just like parents, who name, do, 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 parent, do the kids name the parents or do the parents name the kids? Parents name the kids. Is that an exercise of parental authority? It most certainly is. Reason number six, the man is commanded to take the initiative in leaving father and mother in marriage. You have all kinds of hints in the creation story. It says, Genesis 2 verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Who's to leave who? It says the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. It's interesting that in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, the word uh, man and the word wife here are the very words that we noticed a while ago, aner and gune, very gender specific. Reason number seven, God commanded Adam not to eat from the tree, not Eve. Even before the creation of the woman, God had commanded Adam not to eat from the forbidden tree. There is no indication in the story that God gave this command directly to Eve. And you're going to see where we're going with this. The Genesis story seems to indicate that Adam was expected to relay this information to his wife. Let's read Genesis 2 verses 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. 
To whom was the command given? To the man. Now listen carefully. This chain of command should not surprise us. It follows the basic pattern of how God speaks His will. In Scripture, the Father speaks His will to the angels through the Son. In fact, you have this statement, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 36, where Ellen White says, Christ was the commander of all heaven, and listen carefully, He imparted to the angelic family the high commands of His Father. The Father communicated with the, to, with the angels through who? Through His Son. The Son then imparts the message through the Spirit to whom? To the angels. The angels then relay the message to whom? To the prophets. The prophets then pass on the message to whom? To the church. And then the church is to pass on the message to the world. God has a chain of command. And you know what? I got, I got into studying this. I've been studying this for about 30 years now. How God's chain of command is. I have a series called Revisiting the Godhead. There's four presentations in there. And I discovered that most of the things in the Old Testament that are attributed to God were really performed by the angels commanded by God. You know, Pastor Skeet was talking about the centurion. <laughs> you know, when you read Desire of Ages, you find that the, the centurion, well, actually in Matthew chapter 8, it says the centurion says, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Ellen White explains that when Jesus spoke the word, the heavenly messenger went and he healed the servant. Because God accomplishes His will through the ministration of the angels. And I started studying this. You know, the Bible says that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve. Ellen White says that God, the angels were the ones who made the garments of skin. You know, even, even in Genesis chapter 4, you remember when, when Cain was aggravated because his sacrifice, his uh, offering was not accepted? God said to him, if you do well, Will you not be accepted? But if you don't do well, sin lies at the gate. You know, it says in Genesis that the Lord God spoke those words. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that God condescended to send an angel to speak those words. I think we need a 29th fundamental belief. The angels. Because the Bible is saturated with the angels. Now, you've seen the, the sequence in Revelation chapter 1. Now, let me give you an example, a practical example, of how this mode of communication functions on a human level. I am the president of Secrets Unsealed. And as such, it is my role to provide general supervision to the ministry. The buck stops here. Well, it's not, it really stops up there. But on a human level, it stops here. When I have important information to share with the employees, I meet with the department chairs and share the information with them. And then I expect them to share it with their part-time employees. The word of the department chairs is really my word. And the employees are under the department chairs, under the department chairs are expected to follow my instructions even though they did not hear them directly from me. Isn't that the way corporations work? Absolutely. God, God is a delegator. He doesn't do everything Himself. He delegates responsibility. In the same way, God spoke His instructions to Adam, who was expected in turn to relay them to Eve. In this way, Eve was expected to obey God's word through the instrumentality of Adam. Adam's word was to be considered God's word. In Genesis 3, we find clearly that Eve understood this when she said, God has said. Now, in biblical thought, when God gives a command to the husband, he is expected to teach his entire family to obey the command. 
because he, as the spiritual leader, is the head of the family. For example, God said to Abraham, Genesis 18, verse 19, For I have known him, in order that he may what? Command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he, what he has spoken to him. Does God expect anything less from husbands today? Before, now listen carefully to this example. Before Adam and Eve sinned, we are told that, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 48, the Sabbath was committed to Adam, the father and representative of the whole human family. It doesn't say the Sabbath was committed to Adam and Eve. It says the Sabbath was committed to whom? To Adam. It doesn't say that it was committed to Adam and Eve, the father and mother of the entire human race. So you say, well, then God didn't expect Eve to keep it. Did he? Yes. Adam was to relay the information to Eve. I want you to notice a statement that Ellen White makes in Christ Triumphant, page 18. It seems to contradict this idea. It says, God saw that a Sabbath was essential for Adam and Eve. Even in paradise, in giving them the Sabbath, He gave them the Sabbath, God considered their spiritual and physical health. So to whom did God give the Sabbath? To Adam and Eve. But then she says she gave it to, that God gave it to Adam, the father and representative of the whole human family. So the question is, is Ellen White talking out of both sides of her mouth? No. Clearly the Sabbath was given to Adam, the father and representative of the whole human family, and he was expected to teach his wife and successive generations of the meaning of the Sabbath and the importance of its observance. Regarding this responsibility, Ellen White had this to say. Now here is the balance between those two statements. Adam carefully treasured what God had revealed to him and handed it down by word of mouth to his children and children's children. Who has the responsibility of passing on the truth? The Father. As the spiritual leader, as the house band, the husband is responsible for the religious training to keep the family on God's road. Reason number eight. The woman fell into transgression. Now besides providing several pre-fall arguments, which is the ones that we've just looked at, Paul also provided several post-fall rationales for the submission of the woman to the authority of the man. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and now notice the post-fall reason. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Samuel Bakioki explained it beautifully in the book Prove All Things, 83 and 84, which is a book that every Adventist should read, because every argument that's being presented by the pro-ordination group is answered in that book. It's a masterpiece. This is what Samuel Bakioki said in the article that he wrote. It's a symposium of several authors. Adam willingly let his wife take the lead. She usurped Adam's headship. And instead of being his helper to live as God intended, she led him into sin. Adam failed to exercise his spiritual leadership by protecting Eve from the servant's deception. And on her part, Eve failed to respect her submissive role by staying by her husband's side. The great fault of Adam in the fall was his failure to exercise his role of spiritual leadership. Instead of leading his wife into obedience to God's command, he allowed his wife to lead him into disobedience. It's a reversal of headship, in other words. 
On page 56 of Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White says, she hints at the headship of Adam when she says that Adam mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side. The word permitted comes from permission. Had permitted her to wander from his side. Reason number nine. God required an accounting from Adam before Eve. Let's read Genesis 3 verses 8 through 11. And they heard the sound of the Lord God. Were they both there? They were both there. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam, that is the man, and his wife, they're both there, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man. The definite article is there. And said to him, why would God be requiring an accounting from Adam first? He was the one who sinned first. So you would expect God to hold her accountable first. Right? Said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Is that clear? Crystal. The critical question is, if Eve was the first to sin, why didn't God hold her initially responsible? God is saying, I told you not to eat, and you were the one who ate, and I'm holding you accountable, is what God is saying. He's holding Adam accountable. We'll come back to that in a few moments. Now let's look. The critical question is this. If Eve was the first to sin, why didn't God hold her initially responsible? Why did God address Adam first? The words of God to Adam are too clear to be misunderstood. Notice Genesis 3 verse 16. This is a significant verse. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Who was supposed to heed who? In God's arrangement, who was supposed to heed who? The wife was supposed to heed the husband. But God is now saying to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and it's understood, he's saying, instead of whom? Instead of mine, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. The insinuation seems to be that Adam should have listened to God's voice, and Eve, in turn, should have listened to the voice of her husband and who taught her what God had said. Thus, by obeying Adam, Eve would have been obeying God. Are you following? That's the reason we're going to notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that the, God the Father is the head of Christ, because Christ, Christ listens to His Father. That's what His Father says, submissive to His Father. Then it says, Christ is the head of the man, because the man is supposed to be submissive to the will of Christ. And then it says, and the man is the head of the woman. Do you see the relay, the method that God has for relaying authority? By the way, there are only two individuals in this order that have no head. God the Father has no head. I'm not talking literally. But in 1 Corinthians 11, God doesn't have a head. He's the head of Christ. And the woman is no one's head. Because that ends by saying the man is the head of the woman. The woman is the head of no one, and the, and the father has no one who is his head. Now let's go back to our material. Basically, God was saying to Adam, I commanded you not to eat from the tree, and gave you the responsibility of making sure your wife obeyed my command. Instead, you relinquished your leadership role by obeying your wife's voice instead of mine. Are you seeing the reversal? The man was to be the head of the woman, relay the information, but now the man does what the woman says. It's a reversal 
of the order that God established in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I believe that this chain of command helps us better understand what Paul meant when he wrote that God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. Listen to this, Jesus receives information from His Father, who is His head, and He then relays the information to man as His head. Ellen White profoundly stated this, volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, page 1131, what speech is to thought so is Christ to the invisible Father. You know what she's saying? She's saying the, the, the Father thinks and the Son audibly expresses the Father's thoughts. What speech is to thought, so is Christ to the invisible Father. He is the manifestation of the Father and is called what? The Word of God. The next link in the chain of command is when man receives the information from Christ and relays it to the woman. In other words, when the man, listen carefully, when the man is subject to the headship of Christ, he will in turn exercise a Christ-centered head, headship of the woman, and thus she will be under the headship of Christ through the witness of the man. Is this making sense? But Adam broke the chain of command. Instead of exercising loving headship for his wife by relaying what Christ had relayed to him, Adam relinquished his leadership role to her and obeyed her voice, which in turn led him into transgression. So to speak, Eve usurped the headship position of Christ over the man, and as a result the man disobeyed Christ. In short, Instead of the woman obeying Christ through the man, the man obeyed his wife and thus disobeyed his head, Christ. Is that clear? Now this idea, I want you to pay, pay close, close attention to what we're going to go through now. This idea is further bolstered by God's word to, to Eve after her transgression. Genesis 3 verse 16 says, Speaking to the woman, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Do you know what those who favor women's ordination, how they understand this verse? They understand in this verse that a female submission to male authority is something that originates after the fall. And they say that this, this submission is a bad thing in a world of sin. They say it's after sin that God says to the woman, now you have to be subject to your husband, you have to be subject to the man in a less than ideal way. Are you understanding what the argument is? Now, here's the question. Was this declaration by God a confirmation of a reality that existed before the fall, or was it a divine sentence pronounced upon the woman only after the fall? Are you understanding the question? Expressed another way, was Eve's desire for her husband and her husband's rulership over her a less than ideal arrangement that kicked in after the fall, or was it a reaffirmation of God's original plan, albeit in a less than desirable sinful environment? Every text is explained in its context. Now I'm going to share something with you that was never shared in the Theology of Ordination Committee. It, it was kind of like skipped over, but it's powerful because it shows that Genesis 3 verse 16 is not negative, it's positive after the fall. It's a reaffirmation of God's plan before the fall, that the desire of the woman would be for her husband and that the husband would rule over her. The idea of him ruling over her is not a bad thing. Now let's pursue this. You'll see Ellen White brings out a gem. To answer this question that we just asked, we have to go to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, where the identical two words, desire and rule, appear in the story of Cain and Abel. Those are the two key words. Your desire for me will be for him, and he will what? 
he will rule over you. Now listen carefully. All Bible versions, I haven't found any exceptions, there might be one, that I consulted translate Genesis 4 verse 7 in similar fashion. Let's take, for example, the NIV. God says to Cain these words, If you, that is Cain, do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is what? Crouching at the door, it, that is sin, desires to have you. Same word desire. But you must master it. You must rule over it. Are you understanding? Same two words. Sin will desire to have you, but you have to rule over sin. Now, the King James Version provides a different, totally different perspective. It says in the King James, If thou, that is Cain, doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee Cain shall be his, that is Abel's desire. Are you following me or not? I know it's been a long day. But this is a, this is a very significant point here. It says, and unto thee, Cain, shall be Abel's desire. And you, Cain, shall rule over him, that is, over Abel. Are you with me? Now notice how Ellen White explains this. Very significant. This is in Bible Echo, April, April 8, 1912. She says, Abel's offering had been accepted. But this was because he had done in every particular as God required him to do. If Cain would correct his error, he would not be deprived of his what? Birthright. What, if, what was the birthright? Who had the, the greatest authority among the children? The firstborn. Priority of existence. Notice. If Cain would correct his error, he would not be, be tried, deprived of his birthright. Abel would not only, what? Love him. That is what is meant by, to you will be his desire. Abel would not only love him as his brother, but as the younger would be subject to him. In other words, he would allow Cain to rule over him. Are you with me? Does priority of existence have anything to do with authority? Let me ask you, is the word rule and is the word desire negative or positive here? Positive. Abel, his desire will be for you. He'll love you. And he'll allow you to rule over him because he's the younger and you're the older. Interesting. This translation lends support back to our material that Paul's statement that before the fall Adam was to rule over his wife because he was created first and then Eve is, is correct. She was younger and he was older. She on the other hand was to lovingly submit to her husband because he was older and she was younger. Thus the desire and willing submission of the younger to the older existed both before and after sin and provides one rationale for female submission. Since the very beginning of history, the younger son was to willingly be subject to the loving rulership of the older son. And Adam, who was created first, was to rule over his wife, who was created second. As stated before, this does not mean that the woman was ontologically inferior, inferior as a being to the man, nor that Abel was ontologically inferior to Cain. Were Cain and Abel equal? Of course they were equal. But was one subject to the authority of the other? Absolutely. So this idea that, you know, if you're subject to someone, you're inferior, that just doesn't fly. It goes totally against what Scripture teaches. 
Reason number 10. Nakedness was not experienced until Adam sinned. Have you ever noticed that? When Eve ate the fruit and she approached Adam, we are told that she had not yet experienced the, consequence, experienced the consequences of the fall. Story of Redemption, page 36. Eve was before him, as lovely and beautiful and apparently as innocent as before this act of disobedience. Do you think that if she had been naked, he would have said the same? <laughs> She expressed greater, higher love for him than before her disobedience. As the effects of the fruit she had eaten, he saw in her no signs of death. When does nakedness ensue? When Adam, the father and representative, sins. Then they both become naked. Notice Genesis 3, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, afraid because I was what? I was naked, and I hid myself. Reason number 11. After sin, Adam named Eve again. It says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So does he name her again? Once again, an exercise of authority as the head. Reason number 12. Paul explicitly stated that the man is the head of the woman. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. Notice that Paul does not say that the man was the head of the woman until Jesus died on the cross. The husband was still the head of the wife, even when Paul wrote many years after the cross. Some women, now listen to this, because those who favor women's ordinations, they redefine words and they, 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 they change. You know, they give definitions to words that are nowhere found in the dictionaries. Some ordination lobbyists have attempted to soften or even eliminate the idea that the husband is the head of the woman by arguing that the word head really means source or origin. <coughs> you know what? I checked all Bible versions. The word kephale, head, not once is it ever translated source in no Bible version. One seminary student went so far as to suggest that the word head means completion. This is how the ordination advocate tortuously explained it. As Christ is the enabler, the one who brings to completion of the church, so the husband is to enable or bring to completion all that his wife is meant to be. <laughs> so in this case, the, the man is the helper of the woman to enable her. This certainly is a, is a novel private interpretation that denotes an extreme case of eisegesis that is reading into the text what is not there. Contrary to the clear text of Genesis, this explanation makes Adam Eve's helper rather than the other way around. Not a single lexicon, which is a dictionary, provides completion as a possible meaning of the word. And not a single Bible version translates in this way the word kephale. In fact, the God's Word translation says, it translates it this way, however, I want you to realize that Christ has authority over every man, a husband has authority over his wife, and God has authority over Christ. Evangelical scholar Wayne Grudem, who has dedicated the better portion of his life to study this issue of ordination, did an exhaustive study of the word kephale, the word head, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Plato, in the New Testament, in Josephus, in Philo, and Plutarch, and the early church fathers. You have the reference there. 
and he shows that the word means head. It does not mean source or origin. Several texts from the writings of Paul and Peter clearly reveal that the word kephale is used to denote authority or headship. Bible words should not be treated like Play-Doh that can be molded to take the shape that the interpreter wishes them to have. Now this is a significant point. The Apostle Paul in the well-known marriage passage in Ephesians links the word head with the word hupotasso, which is translated submit. Notice what he says in Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. Wives, submit. That's hupotasso. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, again, so let wives be, and the antecedent is subject, to their own husbands in everything. How do the lexicons define the word hupotasso? Submit in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 22 to 24. The definition in all of the dictionaries is to be subject, subordinate, or to place under. Now here comes an important point. If wives are not required to be subject to their husbands, then the church would not be expected to be subject to Christ either. Because the willing submission of the wife to the husband is predicated on the willing submission of the church to Christ. The Jewish Bible commentary, the non adventist commentary, makes a good point regarding 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. It correctly suggests that if Jesus does not find the headship of the Father demeaning, and if the man does not consider the headship of Jesus demeaning, then wives should not find the headship of their husbands demeaning either. The fundamental problem, folks, is that in, in this sinful world we consider subjection to be a negative thing. We assume that those who submit or are subject them, or subject themselves to the authority of another are inferior to one another, or inferior to the one that they subject, subject themselves to. If this were the case, then the subjection of Jesus to His Father after sin is eradicated from the universe would be a bad thing. Do you know that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that when all things are placed under the feet of Christ, the Son Himself will submit Himself to the Father, that the Father will be all in all, after sin is eradicated from the universe. To be subject to God's established order is sublime, and to refuse is rebellion. The story of Lucifer's rebellion is a living illustration of this fact. Now, unfortunately, our time is flying by, so I'm going to let you read the next section on Ephesians 5 verse 21 uh, at your leisure. And I want to go to where uh, it would be probably on the next page where it says the word hupotasso is used 38 times in the New Testament. Do you see that? Yes? What page is it on? Page 30, what? Page 31 at the bottom of, uh, uh, well, it's at the bottom of my page. What does the word hupotasso mean? What does the word submit mean? Well, let's let several examples tell us from the New Testament. Jesus was subject to the authority of His father and His mother. That was a bad thing, right? To be subject to His father, bad thing to be subject. I'm being facetious. Demons were subject to the authority of the apostles. Citizens are subject to the ruling authorities. That's a bad thing, right? No. It, of course, if the civil power goes beyond its realm of authority. When the great controversy is over, Jesus will be subject, will subject himself to his father. 
church members are called upon to sub be subject to the authority of the elders. The church must be subject to Christ. Servants should be, sub should be subject to the authority of their masters. God has placed everything in subjection to Christ. Angels, authorities, and powers are in subjection to Christ when He ascends to heaven. We are to submit to our Heavenly Father, or as we submit to our Heavenly Father, so we should submit our earthly Father, we should submit to our Heavenly Father. And finally, Christians should submit themselves to God. Quickly, reason number 13. Adam was held accountable for sin, for the entrance of sin, not Eve. This is a very significant point. Romans 5 verses 12 through 21 very clearly tells us that sin entered the world through one man, through Adam, even though Eve was the one who sinned first. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22 it says, For as in Adam all die, not in Eve, but in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Ellen White uses several different terms to describe the leadership position of Adam upon his creation. She refers to Adam as the king, the ruler, the monarch of the world. Never do we find Ellen White referring to uh, Adam and Eve as the kings, the rulers, and the monarchs of the world. In fact, you'll notice in this next paragraph, at creation Adam was installed as king, and as such he was the head and representative of the entire human family. After sin, we're told in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 67, that Adam lost his throne. And Jesus became a man, conquered Satan in Adam's place, and became the new head and representative of the human race. But lo and behold, we are told and this is in your syllabus, that when all things come to an end and sin is eradicated, the two Adams will meet, not Adam and Eve and Jesus. The two Adams will meet, and Adam will, Adam will be reinstated in his first dominion. Some people say, well, didn't God give dominion to both? Yes, he did. Just like the Father and the Son had dominion. But the Father has the utmost authority in the relationship. Are you with me or not? Reason number 14. The death sentence was pronounced against the man, not the woman. Is it understood that the woman followed the man in the sentence? But God pronounces the sentence upon the man because he's the one accountable. It says in Genesis 3 verse 19, In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. This can't be referring to Eve because Eve wasn't taken out of the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The sentence of death was pronounced upon man, of course. It affects everybody that comes from man, beginning with Eve and everyone else. Number 15, the man was cast out of the garden along with him, the woman, but the Bible says that the man was cast out. We understand that when the man was cast out, the woman was cast out too. It says there in Genesis 3.22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Definite article. To know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Once again, the man is at the center of the sentence. Number 16, 
Ellen White confirmed male headship in the home and in the church. This is very significant. Let's read this statement from Councils to the Church, pages 145 and 146. The Lord has constituted the husband the head of the wife to be her protector. He is the house band of the family, binding the members together, and now notice the comparison, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the mystical body. Let every husband who claims to love God carefully study the requirements of God in his position. Christ's authority is exercised in wisdom, in all kindness and gentleness. Are you listening, husbands? How does Christ's authority, how is Christ's authority exercised? In wisdom, kindness, and what? Gentleness. And now notice. So let the husband exercise his power and imitate the great head of the church. From this statement, we can reach three conclusions. Number one, if it were true that the husband is no longer the head of the wife, then Christ would no longer be the head of the church. Because the headship of the husband over the wife is predicated upon the headship of Christ over the church. Second, it is important to note that Ellen White is clearly alluding to Ephesians 5, 31 to 33. In these verses, Paul is not arguing from a plan B post-fall perspective, but rather from God's original pre-creation plan, as can be seen by his reference to Genesis 2, verse 24. Clearly, in some way, the relationship between husband and wife is a model for the relationship between Christ and his church. And this is how the Apostle Paul expresses it. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And then, of course, Ellen White makes it very clear that the man, because he's the head, shouldn't think that he's a dictator. In Acts of the Apostles 3.60, she says, It is no evidence of manliness in the husband for him to dwell constantly upon his position as head of the family. It does not increase respect for him to hear him quoting scripture to sustain his claims to authority. It will not make him more manly nor to require his wife, the mother of his children, to act upon his plans as if they were infallible. So Ellen White says that just because the man is the head of the woman doesn't mean that the man is a trample upon the woman. Now, I want to deal with one final point. Does male leadership in the home apply also in the church? Those who are in favor of women's ordination say no. They say, many of them say, we're willing to accept that the man is the head of the home, but we refuse to believe that that spills over into the church, that the man has to be head in the church. They must not believe what the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say. Let's read a couple of passages from Scripture and then from Ellen White and we'll be finished. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, the word bishop means overseer, he desires a good work. A bishop, that is an overseer, must be blameless. The husband of one wife. What part of that don't you understand? Is that clear? A clear reading of scripture? The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospital, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Yeah. And now notice, the bishop or overseer in the church, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Does being the head of the family qualify you, uh, an efficient head of the family qualify you to be the overseer in the church? Clearly. 
And then the Apostle Paul says, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church? Titus 1 verses 5 through 9 make it very clear. Here Paul is giving counsel to Titus, his pupil, and he says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint what? Elders in every city as I commanded you. Now what characteristic do those elders need to have? If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having what? Faithful children. Are you with me? Does the home have, have anything to do with leadership in the church? Absolutely. Not accused of dissipation or insubordination for a bishop. See, the word bishop or overseer and elder are interchangeable. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. I'm going to end by reading this final statement that's found in volume 5 of Manuscript Releases, page 449. You have two other ones there where Ellen White makes it clear that leadership, male leadership in the home is a qualification for being a leader in the church. Notice what Ellen White says. These qualifi the, the qualifications of an elder are plainly stated by the Apostle Paul. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop that is an overseer, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed. So she quotes this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then she makes this comment. If a man does not show wisdom in the management of the church in his own house. What is your house? Your house is, the, is a church. A small church. And the church is composed of a lot of small churches. Notice what she says. If a man does not show wisdom in the management of the church in his own house, how can he show wisdom in the management of the larger church outside? It's good to hear that you're still awake out there. <laughs> notice now, the, the, notice the, the gender of the pronouns. How can he bear the responsibility which means so much if he cannot govern his own children? Wise discrimination is not shown in this matter. God's blessing will not rest upon the ministers. He's talking about pastors here, as we call them today. Upon the minister who neglects the education and training of his children. He has a sacred trust, and he should in no case set before church members a defective example in the management of his home. Can it be any clearer? Is there abundant evidence in Scripture of the leadership structure that God has established in the home and in the church? Yes. Crystal. The Seventh-day Adventist church finds itself at a very dangerous crossroads. People say, ah, who doesn't, that doesn't really matter. If you ordain women, don't ordain women. What difference does it make? I'll tell you, when you are disobedient to God's word, in this matter, you are setting the stage for disobedience to God's word in much larger things. And if we ever prayed before, we need to pray more now than ever before that God will, will be with Elder Wilson, that God will be with our division presidents, that God will be with those who will attend the general conference session in San Antonio next year, that the Lord will lead people to set aside the preconceived notions that they have and that they're willing to go study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and make a decision to vote in favor of being in harmony with the word of Almighty God. Amen. The church will be far better off. If not, there are other issues on the horizon that are much, much more serious. 
So I hope that what we studied is, were, was clear. Is it clear? Yes? Well, at least it was for some of you. <laughs> There's a lot of material there. I hope you'll go over it, read it again, look up the references, and uh, I believe that as you read it, you'll become even more convinced that God has a way of operating the universe. Let us pray, and then please stay for a moment for an announcement. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for, uh, for delegating responsibility. We realize that when you have called the man to be the head in the home and in the church, this is a privilege, but it's also an awesome responsibility. We have, when you have called uh, the woman in the home, in the church, to be subject to the authority of the man, the responsibility of the woman is not diminished. It's a tremendous and important responsibility. I just ask, Lord, that you will bless your church. Your church today is facing huge issues. There's a danger of a rift. I might even call it a schism. Lord, we know that you can work in a powerful way to prevent that. We just ask that you will work upon the minds of, of the division presidents, the union presidents, the conference presidents, that you will be with Elder Wilson, that you will be with, with all of the delegates that will go to San Antonio. Lord, help them all to have the courage to step out in faith and abide by what your holy word says. Your church will be so much better off. We thank you, Father, for having been with us for answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.